Well, good morning, everyone. It's uh, our, our third day of the CIDCI uh, forum, our fall forum. And so we, again, would love to just say good morning to everyone and welcome. So we, uh, today we have an exciting program and it's all part of our new theme of um, the new next normal. So I'm gonna make a few comments to start and then we'll move through the program. So first of all, again, good morning and by the way, good afternoon because we have a number of people on the East Coast and other locations in the globe. So uh, we are very excited about the fact that we have had that opportunity to expand. But again, welcome to day three of uh, these 90 minute sessions. Um, and we look forward to, uh, to your participation in uh, this session and, and the ones on uh, tomorrow and the next day as well. So my name is uh, Stuart Eckblad. I am chair of CIDCI. I think just to remind people, uh, CIDCI is uh, it's an organization that is really meant and really focused on trying to accelerate, I'm gonna say change, but really to accelerate innovation into the design and construction industry and to, uh, to improve our built environment and to help owners and, and builders and designers to to engage in innovation and to have a passion for innovation so that we continue to grow our thinking and our ideas. We do serve as a trusted source of information uh, and that is certainly part of our goal and our mission as well. So in uh, today, um, I think this is a, this is a testimony to, uh, to, to innovation itself in terms of the COVID-19 and how we have moved to uh, adapt to, uh, to this kind of change by having an ability to use Zoom and other technologies to bring us all together in a way that we can engage and learn from each other as, as uh, in this, I'm not gonna say it is a difficult time, but I, I'm not trying to focus so much on that as it is, this is another opportunity for us to pivot in new directions. Speaking of pivoting, so in the, uh, it's really important that since last March, how much we have grown and that we now have a salon series where we have had 13 webinars uh, this year since March. And this, these are important because this gives us a chance to really engage in very direct and smaller groups to have conversations about very specific items. And we would encourage everyone to participate, to be aware of them, be participate. Uh, please um, stay uh, on our website to acknowledge and to understand uh, ideas that we have and uh, opportunities to have to, to engage with us. We've also hosted an innovation lab which we had about 35 individuals and I think roughly 15 firms that really uh, brought people together to really start to, to uh, challenge their own businesses around COVID-19 and uh, innovations that COVID-19 may have brought to their organizations. We also have an Innovation Leaders Roundtable, which is an exciting program where innovation leaders, organizations who have, I'm just say, uh, disciplines of uh, innovation, uh, some of those leaders come together and, and have conversations uh, in our forums. And it's just really, again, an opportunity for the industry to acknowledge that there are uh, new ideas, new, new thinking, new organizational structures to deal with innovation. And so with that, I'd like to move forward with, so our CIDCI board, Dean Reed, Howard Ashcraft, Jim Bedrick, Zig Rubel, Larry Hillman, Ian McLaren, Lynn Vitron, Troy Thompson, Calvin Cam. We'd also like to acknowledge that this has been a really important time for us as we, we do have transition in the board and we want, wanted to thank um, members who are leaving the board, outgoing members, and we continue to hope for their participation in a way because they've brought so much to our organization. So Renee Cheng, Chris uh, Lukeman, Nikki, Dennis Stevens, and Eric Raff. And again, just personally um, I'm representing the board myself, just saying personally thank you and continue to look forward to uh, starting to stay tuned with your roles in the industry and how you're making changes uh, in improving our industry. So again, thank you for your contributions. Again, CIDCI does have a, 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 a newsletter and a free online webinars for our community. So we would love uh, to hear from you. We would really like, very much like to understand what is it uh, that we can bring to you and what uh, ideas do you have that uh, you can bring to the industry. So 
we are looking forward to that. But one of the questions that we would want uh, that we have asked before is, are there particular issues or people you are interested in learning more about? We'd also post a question to you as well in terms of when we start thinking, you know, innovation is, a, is an easy word uh, to say, but how do we start to have, give it meaning? And so one of the things that we've been talking about is, so how do we, maybe a question we might be asking ourselves each individually is, so if I could change one thing, if I could create one thing, what might that be? And how do we bring that then to our, to our work? I think we have a um, message from um, uh, Jess Kelly. Why CIDCI? Because in our industry, it's easy to get caught up in the daily tasks associated with budgets and schedules and the activities needed to get the project done. But if we want to achieve something greater than the status quo, we need to take the time to focus on innovation and what's next. CIDCI offers us that opportunity with their salons and annual conference and also with their teaming up with UC Berkeley where you can, in their learning lab where you can focus on a problem specific to your needs and be coached by outstanding design thinkers. But the aspect of CIDCI that, that found most valuable in my career is being involved with the Innovators Roundtable, where a small group of innovation leaders across very progressive companies come together to talk about their approach to innovation, the challenges and successes they've had along the way, and how they've overcome them. Hearing from others in this open sharing model, back and forth communication and collaboration allows me to better craft my own plan for success. And that is why CIDCI. Thank you, Jessica. I appreciate that. So I'm gonna move forward now to uh, uh, our sponsor. Uh, our sponsor for this forum uh, is Convergent Technologies. And again, we'd certainly like to thank them as well. This is uh, this is really important to, to us to be able to get our word out there to get our recognition, but but really to build these forums and these communities together. So thank you very much for sponsoring uh, this program. And then related to a sponsorship. So this is an opportunity to recognize the sponsors we have. And also, I'm just going to say it now, if your name isn't on this list, we'd love to add your name to this list uh, in the future. So please don't, don't be shy, give us a call. And uh, we would be love to work together on uh, sponsorships. This is a really impressive list. And we are really appreciative of not just the, the, the sponsorship and the participation, but the, the fact that these firms are so passionate about how do we make our industry and how do we improve our industry. As I said before, we'd love to add your names. Please give us a call. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Chris uh, Lukeman. Uh, who is joining us in Switzerland. So, Chris, thank you. Thank you so much, Stuart. And hello, everybody, from the end of my day, the beginning or middle of yours. The past two days have been really quite a tour de force for CIDCI. And as Stuart has already mentioned, you know, this is a great platform. And we also heard from Ms. Kelly about sharing, especially at these difficult times where we're all faced with a, an altered reality, we could say alternate realities and how we've been learning from the healthcare industry, from, from, from folks yesterday about data, what they've been doing and what they have reacting to and how they've moved forward. Monday, we heard from four individuals out of the healthcare world. And what's quite impressive for me is to hear how James Pierce talked about moving directly their entire focus into developing their capacity for dealing with COVID, with having daily 9.30 huddles. Larry Kohler from Sutter also noted their intensity and their increase in efficiency. I heard that yesterday, I just this afternoon, I was on a, a meeting with uh, Singapore where they've noted in the agencies that somehow now they can seem to get five days of work done in four. And uh, they're not quite sure what to do with that extra day. Hmm. So whether that's good, yeah. and then we also heard that uh, this is quite interesting, a few instances, a few instances that some of the building officials and um, regulators were really under, very understanding and helped to ex expedite action, especially COVID focused action. I think this could, we all love to hear that. Joel, UC Davis mentioned how they're about their three day, three, three day express conversion to extreme lean. And I like that, this, this idea of this 
how do you convert? And, and none of us, none of us two, three years ago would have ever imagined that we could all do this digital transformation in three, four days, you know, for many very painful, but we all are here and we're all doing it. So that's quite interesting. And Pete from Kaiser really talked about their wide ranging programs, explore how to turn pretty much all of their assets, offices, parking garages, all into ICUs. And thankfully didn't have to use it, didn't have to do it, but an exercise, I think for all of us thinking some of the unthinkables, what would we need to be doing if, if something happened? And for example, with climate change, what, what are we gonna to have to be doing with these things? But one thing that came up on the first day and the second day was almost the opposite was there was more questions than answers. There were really more questions about what the future was going to look like, the waiting room, the, the operating room, the floor layouts, what's going to, to be COVID or say distance compliant? What was that really going to look like? How do we really need to rethink projects which are already underway? How do you social, how do you social distance on a construction site? You know, now, you know, forget it. But my favorite quotes were Larry saying he probably will never go back to the office full time. And of course, may we hear that quite often. And this is very lucky for those who get to sit in an office you don't have to stand to work, you know, that we can actually have that choice. James, who said, remember, like with telemedicine, we're just trying to keep up. And I thought that was really quite interesting how over years telemedicine has been around, but all of a sudden, bam, now everyone's into it. And Pete said, I wonder if we're ever going to be able to outfit our homes with the same quality monitoring as we do for diabetics, where diabetics, we monitor blood sugar every three seconds or so. With our, with our homes, what kind of data will we be having? And that led to the day two. And Joel, finally, we have now proven that distributed working actually is viable. No one would have believed that we could have done that, but all of a sudden it now became not only viable, but a must. And then yesterday, we had some really fantastic examples of how startups in our domain, some from inside our domain and others from outside, looking at how to actually take data and innovation and make things better. Not just, not just a solution looking for a problem, but actually challenges which we face in our industry that were being now solved. So looking at the data providing, data-driven decision-making, which is fantastic in healthcare, but also clinical choreography and spatial distancing, then drone-based staking out of our, uh, on our civil sites what a pain in the tushy it is to go out there and stake out hundreds, if not thousands of, of sites. And they've got drones that can do it in robot based striping. So you can actually do that to actually put your, as he said, your blue, your, your old blueprints are actually then physically laid out or IOT for smart operations. So some excellent solutions there, really looking at a very broad spectrum of management systems. And last but not least, I learned that in the United States, there's one bridge failure every three days. I mean, I didn't know that. Um, and I thought that was uh, just shocking to hear. And but be able to, <clears throat> to use drone and mapping to look at the condition of structures, even down to cracks and micro cracks. And then through that, being able then to predict what's going to happen and also to predict maintenance procedures in a way which we just, this has been a, a, this has been a, a bridge maintenance dream for, for decades if only we could. And to me, this is really so much of also about with CIDCI, what we're trying to do is if only we could do this to exceed our expectations and to go beyond what we didn't know we needed to do, which is what we're gonna hear about next. So today we're having a very different format than we have up to today and the last year. Um, our own Margie O'Driscoll is going to interview some, but probably few of you know yet, but you will, and you will know his name after this, and you will be quizzed. You'll be sent an email with a link. No, I'm just kidding. But Michael Bednark, he's a CIDC board member. Oh, excuse me. No, he's not a board member yet, but what we'll, we're going to, we'll get him on there. Sorry. Sorry, Michael. I'm putting the cart before the horse. Yeah. But Dean Reed, who is one of our board members, read about Michael in New York Times. And some of you also did as well. 
And Margie and Dean then chatted with Michael and were so enamored with his charm and his story that he, they actually said that it has to be shared with all of us because it was truly about, here's an organization who saw a true challenge that we were facing, saw a, a mission, a need, and pivoted and able to really take a look at what we needed at that moment not not thinking i'm gonna hear the story i haven't heard the story yet but it, i'm really looking forward to to hearing this story because it's something that um we all had to do in march was to think about what is it that we need to do now all of us and for our families for our communities for our industries for our countries for the world you know think what 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 did we have to change and this is what margie is going to take us through with michael and i want for all of us to think about that as we're hearing this story, at the end of that, what did we change? What did you have to change? What did you try? What did you not try? What do you wish you tried? What did you try and failed? That's what innovation is all about. So Margie, I can't wait to hear this story. And it's over to you. So thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Chris and, and Stuart as well. Um, I'd like to get started by introducing you to Michael Bednark. He is the founder and CEO of Bednark Studio. Uh, like, uh, like all great um, ventures, he started his venture in a small garage in Brooklyn, uh, not in Silicon Valley. Um, he, at that time, was the chief and the only project manager, draftsman, carpenter, installer, and driver. Uh, as a one-person operation, right? At the time, their, his core business was designing and building sets for film, television, and print advertisement advertisements. Um, as a marketing industry evolved, so did his company. Um, they expanded production capabilities to deliver large format events for consumer brands and creative agencies. And today, Bednark is a fabrication powerhouse specializing in experiential events, architectural millwork, and retail spaces with 117 members occupying a 65,000 square foot production facility at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. So, if I were actually naming this session, here's what I would really call it. How Michael Bednark saved my best friend Kara's life and he's never met her. We're recording this webinar about seven months into the COVID-19 pandemic. And I'd like to you, I'd like for everyone on this call to close your eyes for a second and try and remember what it was like a really long time ago in March of 2020. In early March, Tom Hanks and Rita Wilson had announced they had COVID-19. The NBA suspended its season and the president said, America will again soon be open for business, very soon, a lot sooner than three or four months that someone suggested. We cannot let the cure be worse than the problem itself. Two weeks later, Governor Andrew Cuomo from New York told this to CNN. What is the day like for you now? How is it managing a situation like this? I'm not talking emotionally. I'm just saying in terms of the daily activities, what is this like? Well, this is 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And look, I've been uh, in the federal government. I did disaster work all across this country, all across the world. We did disaster recovery, as you know. Uh, I've been in this state. I've handled everything in this state. So it's the, the, uh, the hours don't matter. It's the consequence here. It's the consequence here. Christopher, the numbers are big and it's life and death. Uh, and if they are anywhere close to right on these projections of how quickly these numbers are going to grow, the number of people who we are going to lose can easily be in the thousands. And God forbid we say, uh, we could have saved them if we had the right equipment. That's what keeps me up at night. And that's why I'm as strident as I am uh, about these ventilators and the urgency of the ventilators and the equipment. Because it literally is life and death. You see it coming. It's two weeks, three weeks, four weeks down the road. But it's coming. That wave is coming. Thank you, uh, Governor Cuomo. Um... <laughs> So um, in March, schools were closed, and it seemed like everybody had a new job, including my friend Kara. She was a school nurse. She is a school nurse, and she was sent to the front lines of the COVID epidemic from her neighborhood grammar school 
to Kings County Hospital in Brooklyn to serve as a nurse to support COVID patients. So at the same time as Kara was sent to that hospital in Brooklyn, in another part of that same borough, a guy named Michael Bednark was wondering what to do with his company. Michael, can you share a little bit about your company and what your company did before March of 2020? Uh, thank you, Margie. I will, I'm will. i gonna just run through what our company was, say, January 2020. I'm gonna just share my screen. So uh, my company is a custom fabrication company based in Brooklyn, New York. We're in the historic Navy Yard. You can see um, our, we're part of the one leg of that U. Um, it's an innovation sort of uh, hub here in Brooklyn. On the top of the U is a, company, uh, a place called New Lab. And on the other side is a company called Cry Precision. Um, so here we go. Solving complex design. Um, we're working on what is our why? Why do we do this? Why do we get out of bed every night? Um, and this is sort of where we've landed. We loved the finding solutions for designers and architects uh, on how to achieve what their goal is or what their design is. So that's sort of what gets us out of bed at night. Super complex, um, lots of different facets and different things that go into each problem. Um, we really love solving those problems. Um, Bednark's based around um, creating interactive, exciting experiences. So this is sort of the key to our whole company and our whole business is like storytelling and trying to, um, you know, create that wow moment for people. We also do retail spaces and we like to think that that's also a great experience for people that connects them to the brand. Um, this is a store that we opened last September for Balenciaga here in New York. Um, we also, in the last five years, we've added millwork and architectural millwork to our offerings. That was um, an initiative I took on just because we were sort of going down a path of only having like one real, um, we weren't diversified. We had like, we were just working in this event world, this temporary world. And I wanted a place for my company and my people to grow um, and get better as they progressed and learn more of their craft. I wanted to be able to challenge them even more. So the architectural millwork is a way for people to continue to grow and hone their skills. Uh, we do a ton of pop-up experiences and pop-up stores um, throughout the U.S. It's been a really popular thing over the last three years. This was um, down in North Carolina with the Jordan brand um, launching the UNC football team's new um, uh, outfits. Um, we also do a lot of different vehicles. Um, so we'll source um, either vintage or unique vehicles. We'll also do just your sort of uh, your bread truck or things like that. This is a Google project uh, launching their Google Home product. And we've, uh, in the last two years, we've started doing public art. So this was in Times Square. Um, the public art is very challenging work. Um, lots of different uh, demands on the piece. Outdoors, this one specifically was outdoors uh, in February in New York City. Um, on the install, I think the temperatures were negative um, and we were doing overnight installs in Times Square. So as you can imagine, metal overnight, negative temperatures, uh, <laughs> a little bit challenging. And also just the site conditions are always a challenge, right? Because everything's made for drainage and nothing's flat. <laughs> so make, making something flat in Times Square was interesting. Um, this is a picture of our facility in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Uh, it was built around 1920. It was a machine shop and they built different parts of, um, you know, battleships in here and then they would get rolled out and uh, assembled in the dry dock that's right across the street. Um, and then I sort of wanted to just talk a little bit about who we are as like a company and these are our core values. Um, this is something that I use daily when I'm like, where do I, what, how am I supposed to react to this? What is, you know, what is our goal? I always come back to these. Um, so it's empower design with intentional engineering, welcome challenge with adaptability and logical solutions act efficiently without compromising quality, and promote transparency, build trust, and celebrate collaboration. And here it is, just like a quick, I know Margie sort of mentioned some of these, but by the numbers, it's, uh, we're 65,000 square feet of manufacturing space. We generally deliver about 800 projects a year. We've been in business for 15 years. Uh, we have one solutions-oriented team and unlimited possibilities. <laughs> <laughs> And um, this is our website. 
built by bednark.com um, that we sort of updated over the last uh, few months since we've had a little bit of time on our hands. Um, so you can see more of our work there. Um, yeah, that's a little bit about what we do. And should I, do you want to talk now more about what was going on in March? Right. So two months later, it's March. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we heard from the governor. <laughs> we heard from the president. So what were you thinking about your business at Brooklyn Navy Yard? Um, so going into March, we were obviously, as Colm was saying, we're, we're super uncertain. We were, we figured we had, like, immediately we're like, okay, what kind of cash do we have on hand? What, how can we sustain this close down of businesses and sort of work from home? Um, we figured we had eight weeks of cash on hand and we need to figure out some solutions. So every day we were meeting about three times a day to figure out, okay, can we lay off? And then there was like the furlough thing, which I feel like no one even knew what a furlough was before March. Um, I still don't think people know what a furlough is. I don't personally know what a furlough is. Um, so we were working really hard to figure out, okay, we'll lay off X amount of people. We'll also have a lot of people that just didn't want to come in. Our business, you know, you, I'd say 75% of my staff can't work from home. They have to be in our facility assembling physical pieces. Um, so we were just trying to figure out what to do. And right away it was like, if you don't feel comfortable coming in, you don't have to come in. Um, and we were just slowly ramping down, ramping down, ramping down. And then, you know, watching the news and being like, what's going on there? We were seeing this PPE shortage and we were trying to figure out, um, okay, well, this is what we have here. Specifically, we have a bunch of 3D printers. So I was like, maybe I can just ship these 3D printers somewhere because obviously someone's doing this, right? This is, someone's already thought about this. They're already doing it. Um, and I reached out to the Brooklyn Navy Yard, who's our you know, landlord. And I was like, guys, I have all these printers. Like, I have uh, some masks. You know, most all of our people on the shop floor wear a mask generally just for dust uh, reasons. Um, so what can we do? So we basically donated all our masks away. And I was like, let us know. Like, we have these 3D printers. I can ship them to anywhere. And they're like, well, actually, we're going to need a few things. There's a some people in the Navy Yard uh, that are working on emergency ventilators, can you help them? So we teamed up with a company here called 10X Beta, and they were working with MIT um, to develop a ventilator. We cut a ton of custom parts for them um, over a weekend, and they were driving them back and forth up to Harvard. That, they actually got uh, emergency approval on that project, and they manufactured, I think, 3,000 um, emergency ventilators now. Um, while we were in that process, the Navy Yard came to us and said, hey, we're going to need face shields. Face shields is something that's going to come up. The Department of Health really needs it. Can you do it? And this is like a Friday night, 6 p.m. I was like, yeah, I think so. Like, they're like, well, okay, cool. We're going to send you one sample and you reverse engineer it. We're like, okay. So we get it. We reverse engineer it that night. Um, and then the next morning, or like 10.30 that night, the Department of Health is like, this looks amazing. Can you come bring it to us tomorrow morning? And... Um, We'll review it together. So we went um, like a Sunday morning, Long Island City, no one's on the streets. We just meet some person outside the Department of Health. And he's like, these are amazing. Now, when can you have 500,000 of these ready for me? And I was like, uh, 500,000? <laughs> he was like, yeah. I was like, okay. He's like, well, I'm going to take these. I'm going to go upstairs. I'm going to meet with my staff. We're going to just fiddle around with them, see if we want to make any changes and then go from there. So at that point, I called all my sort of executive team. I was like, guys, we gotta figure out how to make 500,000 of these things in like a week. And this is a Sunday during, and everything shut down. So we're like, oh, okay. So we figured out, you know, we put our work from home team on sourcing materials. We knew we needed foam, we knew we needed plastics, and we knew we needed elastics. Um, so we immediately started, that Sunday started trying to source stuff. We have friends in the fashion industry, so we're like, hey, who do you buy your elastic from? Do you have a trusted supplier? We have a, we work with a lot of plastics here, so we had vendors for plastic. And the foam, I just started Googling, like, where can I get this foam? Because it's basically a weather stripping foam. It's a one inch by one inch piece with an adhesive on the back. So I just started calling around. Randomly enough, there's a place like five blocks from our shop that they do all types of foam and rubber. Um, so they became our main partner on that. And then, um, we just sort of started the next morning on that Monday morning, we figured out, okay, how many, you know, we're doing the numbers. So how many face shields could one person assemble? How can we make it as efficient as possible? How can we make it foolproof, right? We're going to make 500,000 of these. We don't want them to show up in sight and then break. 
Um, so we did a lot of like R and D and different things. Um, the DOH was like, well, we want to have them adjustable. So then we worked out a way to adjust them. Um, we sort of came up with this weave situation where you can adjust the uh, mask and then there's less possibility for breakage or, cause what a lot of these are, they're sort of heat, heat, uh, heat glued or they're riveted. Um, and that was just, we didn't have those, those machines uh, or anything to do that or the know-how. So we did a weave that's adjustable. Um, and I think, so that Monday we sort of set up our supply chain. We secured a space with the Navy Yard, within the Navy Yard to start assembly. And I think on that Wednesday, we brought in 150 new employees um, and trained everyone how to do it. We came up with a COVID safety regulator uh, rules for the yard, uh, for inside the warehouse. So once you came in, you got your thermometer checking. And mind you, this is like March 20th or something, March 22nd, before anyone knows anything. So we set up all these protocols. Everyone wears gloves, everyone gets a mask. We um, got restaurants to cater lunch so no one had to leave the building. Um, and mind you, like all these people are coming in, they're risking getting infected. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that we had the, a safe space for them. Um, and then we, we went into full production on that Wednesday and on that Saturday, we delivered our first 50,000 of the 500,000 um, units. So it was very fast, but it was really just about seeing what material, like what we had for machinery and capabilities and what we knew and how we could turn that into something completely different product that we've never made. Um, that was sort of, uh, that was really key to what we we did. Wow, that was great. Hey, Michael, could you uh, stop screen sharing? Because we want to look at your mm -hmm. beautiful face while we're talking. To you. <laughs> and, and I want to I want to ask you some questions. Like, so you use this royal we here, um, mm -hmm. sort of we do that. And I wonder if you could break it down. Like, who was that we? Did you have like a small core group of people who you had already worked with? Or tell me about who those people are and how you assembled your team, team. See, when i say we it's like my team here there's um you know our sort of executive board is three people it's jeremy summer and Raphael. so we were sort of all in a group we were sort of like our bubble in the office and working together and then it was um our other team members so we were basically guys this is what we're doing i know we told everyone to go home on friday and we're shutting down for three weeks uh, but if it, there's anyone willing and feels safe coming back in, can you come back in? We're going to need people to run CNC machines. We're going to need people to pack and count so we know that we have the right counts. Like that was a big, like, I think two weeks learning curve of like, how do we pack and count to make sure we're getting the right amount of shields off the machines and then they make it to the assembly facility and then in the boxes. There was a lot of spreadsheets and a lot of figuring out how we could um, count these sheets. So there's um, that team and then sort of our, you know, like a lot of people st like stepped up, like our carpenters were running CNC machines when they're usually like, oh, I don't need a CNC machine. Now they can all run the CNC machine. So there's just a mixed group of people that were in our shop. And then on the assembly line, we basically put a call out on social media and um, to different, um, different clients of ours that work sort of with staffing and things like that. Can you help us? find 150 new employees quickly. <laughs> um, you clearly must have had somebody who's like organizing, interviewing, meeting, onboarding, teaching. <laughs> there was a lot, I mean, yes. So that's a calls, right? We're in the middle of a pandemic, right? <laughs> so like summer. Throw people it's onto summer. The, the assembly line, right? Yeah, so everyone would get checked in. Obviously we did like a time card sort of system, um, but Summer who sort of was our chief of people was really you know, critical in coming up with that onboarding book. This is what you're gonna do. This is what you can do, this is what you can't do. Like, can't take your mask off. Um, you know, we have to, give you, we had to like, while hospitals are trying to source masks for everyone, we then had to try start sourcing masks for the people on the assembly line, because you can only use them for about two to three days before you had to get a new one. Um, so there's a lot of people here, but like we were a very small team. Uh, we went from, I think, right in February, we probably had 145 people working at that point, and we were probably down to 20 core Bednark people, and then 150 overhire people that just had volunteered. And it was really cool. Like one group, like one section of our group was like a motorcycle club, and they, <laughs> they, they all came in to work on it. Um, and it was interesting because like, we have our own culture here at Bednark, but then the assembly line started to have its own culture. They were doing like 
Hawaiian shirt Wednesdays and formal Fridays. And it was like, you know, they, they made it fun for each other. Um, and I think a lot of, there's like a lot of like amazing relationships built in that uh, assembly line. Imagine, um, you know, at our, we started getting around to like at our output, we were averaging about 35,000 shields a day. So imagine you're just sitting there for eight hours, 10 hours, you're just sort of sitting with a bunch of people. Um, so a lot of like fun relationships and new relationships were made uh, on the assembly line. That's great. I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit, like it, it looks to me like the work that your company usually does is highly complex sort of one-offs. And then mm -hmm. you make this transition to doing complex but repetitive work in other words yeah. a manufacturing company of the same product can you talk can you talk about what that transition was like um i think for us it was like trying to get it right on the first one make sure that the product we were making was repeatable um, and that we could trust that people to put together and it wasn't going to fail going on like we a lot of the stuff we do is temporary and a lot of it's all one off we say we never do the same thing twice so that stuff sometimes you can you get there but it wasn't quite what you wanted it to be it wasn't quite perfect you know um so i think that was the thing that we liked about it is we were able to perfect it over a period of time and make little tweaks whereas a lot of the work we do is very fast paced and temporary so it's almost more important to have it there <laughs> than to not have it at all um, and I think that was rewarding for the teams. I mean, we did, so usually we're doing like one, one, maybe we'll do like one to 10 of something. But for this project, we ended up doing, we spent 90 days working on it and we ended up securing a contract with the city for 2.7 million face shields. So I think the thing that was rewarding about that is A, the volume, who makes millions of anything? Um, B, being able to perfect it over a little bit of time and tweak it um, and try to find efficiencies. I know like, while we were moving along, it's like every sort of new purchase order we got, they wanted the price to go down. So we were trying to figure like, as that was like, okay, so we need to shave a dollar off this face shield. How can we shave a dollar off this face shield? So there was like that process over 90 days that was really rewarding and exciting. Also a little stressful because, <laughs> you know, we're trying to source high volumes of plastics and elastics um and right we were like literally 24 to 48 hours ahead of other manufacturers making face shields so we thought we were securing the materials we need what we found quickly was that other people were buying it and then the price skyrocketed it went from you know we agreed to a price with the city for five hundred thousand, and then our plastic sheet goes from 12 dollars a sheet to 33 dollars a sheet that's a problem in manufacturing right <laughs> so just like having to figure that stuff out and we also like there was like, it was time of timing of, of the essence, right? People were dying and we didn't want to miss our deadlines and what we said we would deliver it to the city because we're really just helping our community. So we really didn't want to miss deadlines. So we're, we're shipping plastic from California. We were shipping it in from, you know, Michigan. We were talking to any sort of plastics manufacturer, plastic vendor that we could to keep our assembly line moving. Um, so there was like those challenges um, that were fun and also rewarding um, based on like what we do normally. It's like, you know, one off things that are beautiful and exciting, but sometimes you just feel like you could have gone a little bit better. And we don't have that sometimes in our other projects. So you did tell me uh, when we talked earlier uh, a bit about when you were creating your first prototype where you sourced some of those materials. Uh, yeah. when you just learning how to build these yeah so i have yeah so this is here like this elastic um our one of our uh foremen his wife is a costume designer and it was like a saturday and i was like obviously nothing's open and i was like bartley um does your wife have any elastic and then they came, they rode their bikes over with a bunch of different types of elastic for us to work with um the foam was like i know i can get something similar to this at home depot so we were at home depot buying weather stripping i think we were also using like a packaging foam that we had um so we were really using a ton of resources from within our group of friends and employees to figure out how we could get these things products in when the city shut down and on a weekend so yeah, there's, there's a lot of little like things like that. I mean, I think I went, before we went to the Department of Health that morning, I went to Home Depot and bought like all different types of weather stripping. <laughs> so yeah, there's like all different resources. 
I love the image. I, I know San Francisco's public health director, but I love, I have this image of you talking to our public health director, Tomas Aragon, like sort of on the street, Sunday morning, you know, <laughs> like all huddled down, the city's completely shut down and saying, hey, I got something for you. Is this what you need? You know, almost, exactly. almost like we think about drug dealers or something like that. Exactly. No, it was, it was like, it was a very like surreal moment because it was just like empty in New York. And it was like sort of overcast. Is definitely that picture comes to mind for sure. <laughs> That's great. Um, I'm wondering how your employees, especially the new employees, sort of responded to the safety protocols and like like what was that all like? Because you have the people who are part of your company, and then you have this like whole new group of people kind of coming in. And first of all, there's the building of that culture, but also in the middle of a really stressful time for everyone. Yeah. I mean, there was like, everyone was super stressed, but every, and everyone was very dialed in on keeping everyone safe. Cause like, if we had an outbreak within the manufacturing facility, we're dead in the water. Um, and we basically, it was really about helping the community, like giving back to the community. Um, everyone was really responsive and really took pride in making sure that they were doing all the protocol that we talked about. Um, I mean, we're, we still do now we like, you know, seven months later, we're still doing the same protocol, but in our main manufacturing facility, you know, everyone comes in, you fill out a survey, have you done any, have, you know, have you traveled, have you been in contact with anyone? Um, I think everyone was really proud to be able to come in and do that work, and they weren't going to take it lightly. So they're going to make sure that they did everything that we needed them to do in order to keep it safe. So lots of hand sanitizer. We sterilized the uh, assembly line every night. Um, so everyone knew we were taking care of them, and they, in turn, were going to help us. Um, and, you know, over time, people came and went, and we had, you know, we just kept refilling the ranks as we needed. Um, some people came over two weeks. Some people stayed for 90 days. Um, it was, yeah, they were just, they were happy and proud to be there, proud to serve their community. Um, you know, it felt like a wartime effort, um, you know, and then we're in the Navy Yard. There's just, like, this, like, ghosts of the yard you know um in when during world war ii like the navy yard sort of really ramped up in like brooklyn i think there was like seven thousand jobs added and like brooklyn really came and filled all those positions so i think it was sort of a similar pride and uh you know duty to country type of thing um mm -hmm. that everyone sort of responded to and uh was it was just a positive experience you know, uh, hearing about the Brooklyn Navy Yard reminds me about in San Francisco, we have, for example, the Hunter's Point Shipyard, and it is that sort of small business incubator opportunity for people, um, which you don't have as, you know, cities have become so expensive, especially their downtown core. These sort of messy manufacturing areas are actually really critically important in, in this particular moment. You couldn't imagine doing this on Park, doing your work on Park Avenue, for example. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> And also what strikes me is the opportunity of the networks of you knocking on doors and being able to walk down, you know, it, not that we can't all be connected via the internet, but that you could walk down and say, hey, could I see that piece of foam? Could I see that piece of plastic? Mm -hmm. you know, can I see that, touch that to figure out if it's going to work? Yeah, in the very beginning, we, um, we were trying to keep up with demand for cutting shield blanks. Like this is sort of a, a flat blank that we were cutting. Um, so you cut these notches out and you cut this. We have um, three CNC machines here and we were or actually technically four. So we were, and we were trying to figure out, okay, if we're gonna be able to assemble 30,000 on the assembly line, we can't output that, we can't keep up with that. So we immediately reached out to all the other manufacturers, all the other sort of um, shops that had CNC and we were just delivering plastic around the yard and they were cutting it. We sent them the cut files and they were cutting it for us. So for like the first two weeks, we had probably 10 different shops just cutting plastic for us. And then over time, my team on their CNC machines figured out how they could ramp it up. And so we were originally maybe cutting 5,000 blanks a day in our shop. We got up to about 20,000 uh, shield blanks per day um just figuring out how to stack it where to put little bridges and things like that but definitely having this network in the navy yard helped us to really get going uh, and you know as we tried to figure out the process and it's an amazing thing to be able to walk down the street and see what's going on over here who's doing this 
Um, you know, there's some of us that may compete in certain levels, but um, in the long run, it's better to be friends with everybody because um, you never know when you're going to need them. <laughs> <laughs> need them or want them or something like that Not, something nicer than we need them. <laughs> <laughs> i'm wondering about um what the qualities are of, of somebody you know when we all first started sort of hearing about the pandemic you know people went to many different places emotionally people, a lot of people left new york they left urban centers they went out to you know places where there were less people and they sort of um I don't want to say ran away, but they, they sort of left because they were like, we don't, we don't want to be in the middle of this. And some people hunkered down, stayed in and started doing really amazing problem solving. And so mm -hmm. um, I, I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about what, how those qualities worked with your team. In, in other words, like I'm going to stay in it as opposed to, and, and both yeah. are entirely legitimate. I, I don't mean to add any value to that, but they're, they're two yeah. different ways that people really responded to the pandemic. Yeah, I think... The big thing, yeah, we, I wasn't going to sit back and I mean, I have, I was like, I have these team, I have these facility, I have these machines, like, I'm not going to sit back and just hope it happens or hope something happens. Um, I think our team, we started with the face shields and then we just started to continue past that. We're like, okay, what else could be needed? What else could people use? Um, and so we were searching a lot, uh, you know, seeing what people were doing. Um, we even tasked all our project management team to come up with a COVID product um, that they could develop. And one thing that was a huge success was these Uber dividers. So we're making divider uh, screens that go into Ubers. And it was basically being like, okay, we know that this plastic for the face shields is in high demand and we can't use it. What's the next thickness of that plastic and what could we use it for? So that was, we, we developed a sort of non, um, non-damaging, easy to install in low cost um, divider for Uber drivers. So it's basically a big face shield for the back of their car. Um, so we did that, we've installed over 5,000 of them. But I think what we really, you know, we just asked our team like, hey, who's comfortable? Who wants to get in? And like everyone, they answered the call, you know, they really wanted to do it. And I think for me, it's like, if I was sitting at home, I would have gone crazy. So I'm like, someone needs to solve this, someone needs to fix it. And it just goes back to, you know, our sort of core values and, um, you know, just trying to solve complex issues in general. Um, and that's sort of the basis for all of our team. I know that there's other companies where everyone just sort of went away, <laughs> you know, for a long time. And there's some, some really sad stories where, you know, owners or CEOs just didn't know how to deal with it. It's this horrifying situation. You see your thriving business go to zero and then how do you react that you don't see it coming back for years and just last month your projections are great and then all of a sudden like dealing with that stress and just seeing everything you've worked on for so long vanish i mean it's horrifying uh, for us for my take on it i know there's some takes that it's like okay everything's gone i'm done my take on it was okay, the whole world is on a pause. The whole world is paused. When in your life is this ever gonna happen? Hopefully never again. Um, and what do you do, right? Um, is it, do you reinvent yourself? Do you maybe decide to go open an ice cream shop somewhere? Um, you know, there's like, I was talking with this, like with, we have our all hands team calls. And I was like, guys, like, we're gonna be not doing anything for three months. This is your time to be like, hey, do I really like this business? Is this what I want to be doing? Or is there something else? And we have a lot of people that sort of, they moved out of the city during COVID and they're like, you know what? Maine is pretty nice and I could live here, <laughs> you know? So we have a lot of employees that didn't come back because they're like, I'm going to go reinvent myself somewhere else. So I think just taking that pause um, and seeing what you can do with it. I know like throughout, so like for the six months, we really looked inside and we were like, what are we doing wrong? How can we do it better? How can we track our costs better? How can we be more efficient? Um, how can we restructure our entire company so that when this does come back, uh, when we do come back, we are stronger and better because for so long we were on a treadmill. We were just running, 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 running. And it was just like, okay, yeah, we'll figure that out later. And like, we never took the time to really put in process and put in systems. Um, and we really took this time as a way to get better 
and a pause. Like, I think I would have been really upset if everyone was doing great in the world and my company was failing. You know, that would have been really bad for me. But knowing that everyone was sort of pausing and like breathing, um, I knew that it was going to be okay. Or in my mind, I was like, this is going to be okay because we're all sort of in this together. Um, and like, so how are we going to, how are we going to come out? How are we going to hit it once it gets back? Um, and I thought that really taking the time to change all that process and reorg our, our company was the, the thing that we needed to do. Can you talk about some of the changes which you have implemented, you know, it, it, since you've had this pause period? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, <laughs> well, I mean, sort of two years ago, I sort of started this leadership journey that I've been going on and reading, you know, I've um, worked with some coaches and done a lot of reading. So it's just me, uh, for me, it's been um, sort of pushing down uh, decision making and like getting it into the hands of the people that really need to make the decisions. Um, I think for a long time, my company, I was like, I was sort of making the decisions. I thought that was the right thing. And it's not, you need to really empower everyone. Um, to make their own decisions and to see problems in the field or on the shop floor and call them out or just fix them. Um, so just really empowering my entire company from the top down to the person that's sweeping the shop floor to the person that's assembling something, the CNC operator. It's like, I'm not there and I can't figure out what you need, but I hope that you're able to figure out what you need and how you can be efficient and hey, I know you guys drew it this way, but it's way easier for me to cut it this way and it'll still go together. Um, I think that's the biggest thing is trying to push down decision-making. Um, also, we just sort of restructured, we, we promoted people into different positions. We put in cost uh, tracking and now everyone uh, in the shop floor clocks in and out of projects as they're doing it. If you can imagine, we never did that before. Uh, everything was just a big clump of money <laughs> that we paid every week. But now everything's assigned to jobs. Um, we've, you know, we we work with an we had we put in a new um, project management system. We're using Asana for that. We're using SAP Concur for um, budget tracking, and so it's just things like that. So right now, like, how do we get by for another six to twelve months? Mm -hmm. And we really needed to tie down, like, reel back our budget, figure out what our budget is and then make educated decisions from there. Um, so that's sort of what we did. So we really like, we gave everyone a new offer We implemented a new bonus program and bonus structure. Um, but like right now we're operating at one third of what we usually operate at. So we really needed to tighten it up and we can, we know we can get through these next 12 months as long as we really keep an eye on everything we're every cost, every item, make sure that things are going together as budgeted versus just getting them done and do a ton of overtime and be over with it. Um, so we're really changing in that way. Um, another thing we're trying to find is like long-term business, uh, more contract-based business. Um, generally, you know, a year ago, all our jobs were two weeks, three weeks, and we were just running each month. Um, so we're trying to figure out how we can fill our schedule with longer term projects that deliver over a longer period of time. Um, so that's a new idea. Um, I think like one thing that came up last week was like elevator interiors. Um, there's a neighbor here in the Navy Yard who needed help. Um, he's a big elevator cab company and he's like, you know, COVID shut us down and then, but everyone expects the deadlines not to shift. So he's like trying to, so we're going to be helping him assemble a bunch of cabs. Um, so that's like, and for me, it's like, that's like a perfect business for us. It has wood, it has plastics, it has glass, it has metal, it has integrated lighting. These are all things that we handle inside our shop on a daily basis. So that, that's like, for me, that's exciting. Um, and maybe that's like a new direction we go in. I mean, to think we were like building sets for film and TV and now we're gonna be building elevator cars. I would never in a million dream, years would like think that that would be something I'd be interested in or excited about. But like when you go in an elevator, it's like one of the more cooler experiences in a building. Yeah, I, and I, we're all thinking about <laughs> elevators now, right? <laughs> How many people <laughs> need <an> elevator? <laughs> exactly. Maybe it's a COVID elevator. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, great. Um, I'm wondering, um, I'm going to just ask you one last question and then um, okay. I'm starting to see some questions pop up in the chat box and I'm going to just pull some out to, to talk with you. I'm just wondering, um, as you think back, if you had 
you've had your own moment to pause. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you wish you'd known, um, you know, or, or that you know now that you wish you'd known six months ago in terms of how you've responded? I mean, I think the thing that I wish I'd known, I wish I'd known on March 1st that this was going to be six or seven months long. It was really hard and scary and touch and go because it would just be like another two weeks, another two weeks, another two weeks. We had job, like big jobs that we needed to deliver in April and May. And it was like, it was unclear. And so our clients were being unclear with us because they didn't want, you know, you know, in construction, everyone's like, hit the deadline. They don't want to give you, like, they're going to tell you the false deadline so that you hit the other deadline. So no one wants to give in. They don't want to give in to like say like, yeah, you have another week, you know? So that was very stressful because we were like trying to figure out how we open these stores in April. Because what if we just shut down for two weeks and then we got to be back up and they're like, well, are they going to give us another two weeks? Um, and then it's just like a whole ramp up thing again. Um, so I wish we had known, I wish we had had clarity on how long this would be. Um, that was the killer. And that's still, it's still uncertain, I feel like. Um, the, yeah, just that unclear. like. It just, it, every day was like, what's going on? Is it kind of happened? And then it sort of set in. And then it, everyone just kept sending these milestones. And it was just like, can't you guys just say the summer's a wash? <laughs> just like, you know, because we're all here like trying to figure out what to do and how we're going to do it. Um, so clarity on timeline would have been really helpful. Yeah, I think everybody, everyone around the world would have liked that and no, none of us have it and none of us are going to get it for quite some time. That's the exactly. most unfortunate truth, I think. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, for sure. Uh, yeah, so let's see, we have a question here from uh, Dean Reed. Um, Dean and I were the ones who talked to you way in the very beginning after we saw that article in the New York Times and Dean says, hey Michael, it seems like your suppliers were critical that you couldn't have made this pivot without them. Um, have you taken steps to maintain relationships with them based on fairness and continuous improvement? Um, I think a lot of our supplier, I mean, we sort of cut some suppliers off the list for sure. <laughs> There's definitely a lot of that, like we're not working with them anymore. Um, but that's no, well, we, that's valuable. <laughs> exactly. No, it's been, um, you know, we, I think for me, it's like critical things are having great vendors and great suppliers um, that want to work with you. And we work hand in hand. We have a purchasing department that's always working with them. I mean, maybe to their detriment, uh, I know our purchasing department's pretty cutthroat and trying to get best pricing for us um, so that we can stay competitive. But we have really great relationships with all our suppliers. Um, and yeah, I, I think you know, I, that's one of my favorite things, someone coming in, you know, he's got to try to sell me something, you know, <laughs> coming in. Um, but no, I love the suppliers. They, we, I mean, we've done a ton of volume with them before, and then we were able to do a ton of volume when they weren't going to do any volume with them. So I think every, it's like everyone's appreciative of the business that we were able to give them throughout COVID. Um, I think that was key. And um, just, you know, as we were able to, you know, add more jobs we we're able to also you know give back to our suppliers and give them you know give them business when they were fearing they would have none that was probably the best takeaway for everybody so we have a question here from ray trebino um with the extreme challenges you face during these times supply chain management reworking the business model supporting the pand pandemic needs of new york what did you personally do to be the calm leader to your staff? And did you have any specific team building events or processes that you could share? Um, me personally, I do a lot. I try to exercise. Um, I was riding uh, during like March, April and May, I was riding um, a city bike back and forth from the shop. It's about 20 minutes uh, from my house. So that was like my big sort of stress relief. Um, team wise, it's, a, it's an interesting question because like going as we sort of moved on, I was getting feedback from my project management team that like they feel sort of out alone. The work from home thing is weird. Like we need to do more things to bring them back in. So we started doing um, like morning coffees, we are calling it. Um, so every morning, 845, you can get on a call from, you know, anyone that's working from home and we'd have a chat there. And then on Thursdays, we either have sort of like some sort of happy hour or something just for everyone to hang out, say what they've been doing, what they've been up to. We would, um, we did like some, I mean, they're sort of silly, but we did like a, uh, 
hard seltzer tasting. Hard seltzer is very popular right now. So we brought in a bunch of different uh, flavors and we sent it out to each person that was working from home. So they, it was like basically like the wine tasting, but a seltzer, <laughs> a hard seltzer tasting. Um, so we did stuff like that. And we also did it with some of our bigger clients. We just got on the phone, um, did some Zoom calls together. Um, but yeah, that was the, the most of the team building was just sort of like happy hours together. Uh, just to commiserate about what we've been, been up to or what's going on. Um, but I think that was like something I didn't expect because I was working in the office the whole time. I didn't really understand the work from home dilemma that was going on. Um, but right now we have everyone back in the office. So we usually do more team building, more barbecues, more you know pizza parties and stuff like that. But just due to like tightness of cash, we haven't been doing uh, anything like that. Uh, we don't want it to look like we, you know, everyone here going into the pandemic took a 15% pay cut. Um, and we don't want it to look like we're spending money frivolously that could just easily be going back into our staff. Um, so that's sort of, um, we sort of pared back that team building, I guess, but I don't know. Now I'm like, oh gosh, I gotta get back into it. I gotta figure out some low cost team building. Uh, things but yeah it was just um, morning coffees and we do like a Thursday happy hour check-in yeah what's going you're on. creating those opportunities for people to connect and I think that's what yeah we really appreciate now because uh, mm -hmm. it could be so difficult if people are working from home and then homeschooling their kids or taking care of their mm -hmm. elders you know there's just a lot going on for people that that can be somewhat invisible I think um, yeah what also what I also did during that was I was taking Fridays off and I was watching taking care of my kids so my wife could have a break as well. Shout out to Julie, she's watching. <laughs> Love you. <laughs> That's so great. <laughs> um, okay, um, let's see, anything I haven't asked you that you'd like to say? Um, I mean, I don't think so. I just think, um, I don't know, it was, I'm glad to have had this project and glad to have been able to get connected with the city and do that work for New York City. Um, I think that was really an exciting thing. And I think I'll look back on it throughout my life as a very um, impactful thing on my leadership and my team. And um, I hope everyone, um, yeah, yeah. Dean just asked a question. Where yeah. do we go from here? <laughs> <laughs> where, do we, where do we go from here? Uh, we're looking at all options. I mean, I'm basically, I've took in, taken over. So whereas I used to be more in the day-to-day, -day, I'm now high-level marketing and networking and just new business development. That's all I've been doing. I've been on LinkedIn a lot. I rebuilt the website. I handled the Instagram account. Um, who better to sell the business than the owner, right? Um, so I just know... That's what I'm doing. I'm trying to set up meetings with people across the country um, to see what's going on. I'm doing a lot of research on different um, design agencies and architecture firms, like people that we've never gone after. We were so word of mouth and it was so positive in that word of mouth that now we have to really do a lot of outreach. Um, and that's what I'm doing every day, figuring out that outreach, figuring out what capabilities I need to add to the shop so that we can be ready for any new opportunity that comes up. Um, that's what we're really focused on. Um, Cause like, you know, we, we're a totally different company than we were seven months ago. Uh, our architectural millwork division is thriving. Our event business is gone. Um, and so what's in the middle? What can we find in the middle there that can work? Um, and there's just so many opportunities for things to be made. Um, I know there's tons of people that make stuff in New York City and there's still more to, that goes around. Um, I was, I was like a little upset to hear that we just opened a major league baseball store in Times Square, but it was built in Seattle. And we're like, this is New York City. We're the best, you know, we have great fabrication companies here. Why are we shipping it from Seattle? Sorry, sorry, West Coasters. <laughs> it's okay. It says a lot about our carbon footprint. You're going to bring exactly. something all the way from Seattle. Like that's a long way to go. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, the, that, I mean, that, speaking of that, that's a huge thing. Um, Google, we work with uh, their events team a lot. It's like, what are we doing about a carbon footprint? What are we doing about waste, right? Because all these marketing events are super wasteful. So how do we solve that? And then just reading about the plastic recycling falsities over the last few months. Um, I think that's going to be something that really affects 
that arm of our business is that not or the semi-permanent stuff that just goes straight to the trash. So trying to figure out how we can reduce and how we can reuse um, that stuff is going to be key. Um, so we're trying to figure that out. And really, it's sort of like, well, you stop building stuff, right? <laughs> <laughs> so it's like a scary thing. But it's like, or it's like, do we offer really elaborate and like keyed in engineering on the front end that figures out how we can get the best usage, we can execute your design, get the best usage out of the material so that we're using less material. Um, but we're then, and then in turn not throwing away as much material. Um, that's sort of the thing we're trying to figure out is like, how can we, you know, make up for lost build by adding on engineering that then in turn allows for less usage of material, but same execution. Mm -hmm. if that makes any sense but <laughs> makes com complete complete sense we we talk about that a lot uh here um we have a great question here from monica zwistler um and she says it sounds like your culture is very positive and community focused and it seems there was a big reason as to why you were able to successfully pivot what advice do you have for leaders about how to cultivate this kind of positivity and community focus um i think it really comes down to who you're hiring and then who's, you know, who are your leaders and how does that leadership, um, you know, trickle down throughout the company? Um, I think I've always had a knack at finding good people, even if like we sort of hire for the person, not for the position, maybe, if that makes sense. Um, if they have the right attitude, we can train them up. Um, but I think having that attitude in the beginning um, is it's harder to learn that attitude than to learn a skill. So having that positivity in the person before um, and then being like, okay, then this is how you assemble uh, a, a coffee desk, a coffee, is, I don't know. Uh, we can teach the skills, but can you teach the mindset? And I think that's the beauty of New York City. There's a lot of people here that come here to make their dreams come true. And um, so we have a great uh, pool to pull from. And um, yeah, so that I think it's finding the good people in the, with the right mindset and then giving them the skills that you need them to do the job. Right, that, there's a, a whole school of teaching, a, a whole school of employment, which has that as their basis, which is essentially, you can teach people the stuff, but you can't teach culture. You know, yeah. that, that's just like part of who you are. Um, so uh, a question here, um, how about your executive and shop floor teams? Where are they going from here? Um, we you know everyone's here. We're going to keep moving. Um, it's just about developing them. I mean, our thing is we want to keep growing. We want to be bigger and better. Um, and that stuff excites us. So our teams are working very hard to make sure that we're positioned to do that. Um, do we have the right skills in the right areas? Are they managed in the right way? Um, yeah, everyone's, you know, I think right now it was, we, we did have to peel back a lot of our team, uh, but right now this core that we have is really solid. Um, they do amazing work on a daily basis. And, you know, I think from here, it's like, how do we get back to where we were a year ago? And then how do we get beyond that? Um, and I think the team that we have here is amazing. And Hopefully we can ride this and get the business to be a hundred million dollar business in five years or something like that. <laughs> so um, has um, some of your past business come back online? I, you know, where different parts of the country seem to be on a different different trajectories in terms of getting back to business, whatever that means in the new. Yeah, I mean, we some of our event companies like we're doing mailers, like sort of um, influencer kits. We've been doing those and sending those out. Um, but the large scale event work probably not until next March or April. Um, we're finishing pre COVID uh, retail spaces. So we're doing stuff here in New York that was already, you know, booked and was supposed to deliver in May, but now we're just delivering that now. Um, we're trying to find new opportunities, um, but mostly it's stuff that we had booked pre COVID. I don't think we've landed any specific contracts. I guess we, yeah. We have, we're actually building Balenciaga in Mexico City, and that was a contract that came in post-COVID. Mm -hmm. um, so the retail, like the big retailers, the high-end premium retailers are still building out their stores. Um, so that, that business is coming back online. The event business is still st uh, stagnant. 
Uh -huh. We've seen a little bit of an uptick in like interior mill work residential wise. We're interested to see where the commercial real estate, uh, the commercial real estate stuff comes. We work with WeWork a lot, um, but we only do their internal art. So we, we work with their sort of art curation team and we build all the art that goes on the walls in their store. So we're, they're still opening offices. They do like a, um, enterprise offices. So they'll, Ford will come to them, JP Morgan Chase will come to them and be like, you guys have the technology and the, uh, the, the data on how offices should interact. And then, so they execute on it and then lease it back to those bigger companies. So we work with them creating signage and branding and also the art that goes in the space. Great. Uh, so we have a question here. Um, you have interesting insight into the rapid scaling up and down of an assembly workforce. You mentioned getting back. Are, are there observations that you have about how things will be built coming out of the pandemic? Are there beneficial learnings that have shifted how you think about assembly in general? And how do you think it will look in 2025 or on? Pull out that crystal ball, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think for us, it's just dealing with people in a shop floor. I think about, I think that's like maybe like, Right now, everyone's in masks, everyone. We actually technically, we did have a scare yesterday at one of our job sites. Someone did test positive, not from our team, but from our client's team. Um, so we had to empty out the shop pretty quickly. Uh, everyone got, went and got tested. It was just anyone that had sort of come in contact. So um, getting back would be not having to worry about people getting infected. Um, Cause you know, that store is supposed to open on like Friday. And then now my whole, ascent, uh, on-site install team can't go back to site. I mean, every we haven't had a positive test from anyone, but there's just that unknown, that period of time when that could hit. So we sort of had to pause on that. And then we, all the people that were working in the shop, like they may have been here on Saturday and there was a truck driver that had come back from site and they may have come in their interaction with them. So that contact tracing, like it killed all our end of day yesterday. Um, so if we can get rid of the virus and having to worry about that, then it's about trying to figure out how we can, you know, it's more about, I think for us is finding new uh, clients and building new relationships. Um, I think we have coming from this different world that's very high pace. Uh, we have different ways of doing things than say in construction and how a shop that has been open for maybe a hundred years does something versus us for 10 years, you can probably go back and forth on both shops and we still both have the same problems, but maybe we look at it from a different perspective. So it's like, how can we insert that perspective into things that have been done forever, um, you know, as an outsider? Um, I think that's what's gonna be exciting for me is trying to find this, when I'm finding this new business that I never thought I'd be doing before is how do I bring our perspective onto it and how we can do it better uh, with better finishes, better engineering, um, and just better foresight on how it's going to be interacted with. I think that for me would be um, something that I'm thinking about and like we get excited about. Um, does that answer it? And 2025, I, I wish it was 2025 because I could look back and see what, the, <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Uh, Margie, I had a question. Uh, <clears throat> so, Michael, um, my question was: so, you know, one of the things that we've learned in in the um, business of design construction is innovation basically sort of happens one project at a time, and and so there, there's really not a lot of um, collaboration between uh, innovators uh, to sort of raise the platform at the same time. So I was just curious in all the work that you have done or are doing, have you, uh, do you work at all intentionally with your competitors to um, see what they're doing or how could a product be improved? I realize there's a com competitive piece of that, but I'm just curious yeah. how you work with your competitors. That's a good, that's a good question. I mean, I definitely look at w what they're doing um, and how they're doing it. Um, yeah, I mean, we, I think that's, that's probably a major problem, right? It's just like everyone's in these silos and they don't want to share it because it's like, for me, I always talk about like, what's my IP? Like, I don't have any IP, you know, I have like, I have all the same machines that I want. I have, you know, I have people that make stuff, um, but like, I don't have any IP. Um, so sort of, our, we're trying to push our IP towards like, 
what we do on the front end, our estimating and sort of that thing. Um, but we don't, I, I do have a couple shops that we work with, like in California, like in markets we don't service, we have shops that we work with mm. um, and we collaborate with. Like during the face shields, uh, our, the shop that we work with all the time in Chicago, I immediately emailed them like, hey dude, we're making these face shields, here's the template, here's this, you know, these are the pieces you need to find. And then he immediately started making them for Chicago. Um, so there, we do have those, not in market, but we do have them across the country. Um, so that was one area. And then he'll also send me back like, hey, I just got this like request for a proposal. He's also been developing um, designs for like sort of touchless Santa experiences. He's more in the theming world, more in um, sort of mall build out. So he was like, Michael, we're pitching, you know, you told me all about these face shield things you're doing. We're now pitching these touchless Santa experiences. Um, so here's our deck. Why don't you start reaching out to your contacts there? So we do do that, I guess. Yeah. Now that I think about it, we do do that. Not in market, not in New York city, <laughs> pretty cutthroat yeah. New York city. <laughs> but, um, you know, outside, cause we, we rely on those vendors cause we, we have clients in California. We have clients in Chicago, Miami, where it doesn't make sense for us to build it and ship it cross country, but they love working with our team. They love our engineering. They love our project management. So we'll develop that and then just, sort of put ourselves on the front end of a shop out there and then they make it and deliver it and we'll send out a project manager to see the completion of the project. So yeah, we do work, uh, yeah, we do, just not in New York. <laughs> yeah, that's great, thank you very much. Thank you, it's a great, yeah. really helpful, thank you. Yep. Great. Chris, I think you have a question as well. Michael, thank you for that story and for your experience and sharing your experience and your learnings. You know, what advice, you've already been asked this once, but what advice would you give, because on the call there is a complete spectrum within our ecosystem. And what advice is as a leader, as, as, a, as a father, as a member of a community, uh, would, you, would you share, like when you look back, you're, you might not have, you might not think you have a whole lot of IP, but you have wisdom. <laughs> I think, right? um, for me, being a leader is it's not leading people, it's taking care of your people. So it goes back to simple, you know, taking care of your family. Um, making sure that everyone's taken care of under your watch is um, the most important thing. Um, case in point yesterday when, you know, uh, we had a COVID positive test and, you know, our clients sort of pushing us, not our client, not our direct client, but they're pushing us to finish the store because they want to open. Meanwhile, it's like, no, 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 like we need to make sure our team is safe and that they're, you know, I'm not going to, for two days of work, I'm not going to jeopardize people getting sick and being out of work for two, three weeks, four weeks. Uh, we need to take this very seriously. Um, it's hard when we aren't getting clear information on what's going, what, the, how this virus interacts. Um, so we need to take, we need to put our foot down and be like, guys, our team, uh, we need to take care of our team and you know, people are very scared. Uh, you know, we had a lot of people in the shop immediately go to get tested. And that was sort of a wake up call for me that people are still very scared of this. Uh, you may not see it portrayed uh, on TV or places like that, but it is a very serious uh, thing that's going on. Um, so I think it's just taking care of your team and knowing that they care about you and, they're and that you're trying to take, make the right decisions and do the right things so that they're okay. Um, I think that's the most important thing you can do as a leader. I think, I think that's a really, that's really great, uh, a great reminder. You know, it's just, I think we heard that also on Monday with some of the, our, our, our speakers on Monday when they were talking similarly with people being now in distributed teams, that there's emotional support and there's a mm -hmm. physical support. I know here in Zurich, but we all were, had to go to everyone had to go to home office we weren't allowed in the institution i'm at the university now mm -hmm. we weren't allowed in the building and so but we all were allowed to buy monitors and you know they said okay mm -hmm. it's going to cost us but you get yeah. the equipment which you need in order to work at home yeah, yeah. no definitely again that's crucial yeah you, you, you've got to do a little bit of that help support each other i think that's really great great to hear you say that too so uh, we were uh, talking about maybe asking if anyone uh, who's on the call would like to share their stories of innovation um, at their company or sort of how they responded to the moment. Uh, and I think we've got, we've got a couple of people whose companies really jumped into the fore. I'm thinking about you, uh, Troy, perhaps. Um, would you like to tell us a little bit about how you responded 
to COVID in your moment? Well, yeah, thank you for calling on us. I, th I think it's interesting. Michael has talked a lot about this culture and technology dynamic. Um, you know, we early on, like a lot of firms, did jump in and, and we're using our 3D printers in a number of offices to print components for face shields and those types of things. But in hindsight, one of the more interesting lessons was connecting um, big events. So in 2008 to 2010, we really committed to sharing work across offices um, as a way of getting through that recession. So that meant coming out of that, we invested a lot in technology, but we also talked a lot about culture of collaboration. So we built a lot of infrastructure internally that let us work across offices seamlessly, even when it wasn't easy to jump in a Revit model across time zones. So one of the biggest things that we've been working with now is we've actually been able to take a lot of that infrastructure that we built internally and share with clients. Um, so we were already using studios in all of our offices, for example, to, to have architects and engineers and interior designers jump into a Revit model uh, just to do work. But now we're in the process of, of sharing that technology and helping clients set up some of that technology in their own space. So now we're doing design meetings with everybody wearing goggles uh, in whatever city they're sitting in, walking through as an avatar in a model. Um, so it just sort of, uh, in hindsight, sort of begs that question, the culture is, the decisions you make culturally inform how you use technology. Um, and it, innovation really is kind of a hedge in, in a world where we all need to be more resilient. Um, and we don't always think about technology and innovation maybe quite that far in the future. <laughs> Troy, that's so great. Um, for those of you who don't know, Troy leads Smith Group, which is one of the largest architecture firms in the United States that does multidisciplinary practice in, in many cities around the country. So, so thank you, Troy. Um, I also realize that we're sort of coming to the end of our time together, and I wanted to pass over the reins to Chris to um, do our, our little farewell. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. It's been such a blast. Um, every one of our pre-conversations, we've had so much fun talking and we've laughed so much. So um, I can't thank you enough because laughter is absolutely the best thing yeah. we could all be doing at this moment in time. It's true. Um, if I wasn't laughing, I'd be crying. <laughs> So thank you, Margie. It's been really nice. Thank you so much yeah, for having we've me. Yeah, we just had so much, such a lovely time <laughs> um, hanging out with you. So thank you, Michael, so much. And Chris, I'll just turn it uh, over to you for the last word. Great. Well, thank you so much, Margie, for bringing, and also to Dean, for bringing Michael into our circle. This was really fantastic and very inspirational. I do, I, I do appreciate that very, very much, especially also what Troy was sharing. You know, Peter Drucker was, was the one who famously said culture eats technology for breakfast, I think it was, or something like that. I can't remember exactly, but, uh, I, and it is true. And this is where this culture of sharing is so important for us within CIDCI, that this, this, this is, we know the only way we can be pushing things forward is to be sharing what we're learning and, and best practices. And I think this is a great example of that and to be inspired from each other. So thank you very much. Tomorrow we have another really great uh, day for us. Tomorrow is the new next normal, dismantling systemic racism through a new business model. And I think this is, we're gonna be talking about the seminal McKinsey report about the impact of discrimination on business outcomes, which you all know has a significant impact. And also hearing from leaders who are changing the conversation. As we say, admission is always free to these events. We would love for you to be a sponsor if you're not. But admission is free because this is this, the sharing is what sharing is caring, as we would say from, from today's theme. So I will say thank you again to Monica for making sure that we get through all of this all right. You're a, you're a wonderful shepherd in helping make sure that happens. And again, Margie and uh, Michael for a really wonderful wonderful morning and evening and I I'm looking forward to going and having dinner now and you guys can have breakfast and lunch and uh, so Stuart nope just thank you this is fantastic thank you Michael appreciate all your insights and thank you Margie and thank you guys thank you everyone yeah. all right everybody well you have a great safe stay safe and uh, don't stress all right. keep smiling <laughs> all right we'll see you tomorrow Thanks. All right. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Bye. Ciao, ciao. Bye now.